I'm Lizzie Burden. I'm a UK economy reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, for the past year or so, I've been writing as part of my job the Beyond Brexit newsletter, which has given me the painful privilege of watching our next speaker's predictions about Brexit's impact on the UK economy pan out on a week-by-week -week basis. Um, previously appointed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer as an external member of the Bank of England's rate-setting monetary policy committee, and since 2013, president of the Washington-based Peterson Institute for International Economics, Adam Posen is perfectly placed to uh, give us the transatlantic perspective on how Brexit has impacted the UK economy and its place in the world. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Adam. Thank you. Um, don't applaud my managing to get out of my chair. Um, I, I, I wish to reciprocate both Jonathan and Lizzie's words. First to Lizzie. Uh, this is the first time we're meeting directly uh, given uh, COVID, but I do read the B for Brexit newsletter, as you all should, and she's been making a real contribution from her perch at Bloomberg, so I'm delighted to have her on the panel, sharing the panel with me. And I just reciprocate Jonathan, one of my closest personal and professional friends. What he and Anand Menon and their colleagues have accomplished with UK and changing Europe, um, I think is extraordinary. I, the crowd here and online is in recognition of what they've achieved as the center of objective, relevant, honest, and topical work. Uh, serious work on Brexit and on related issues of Europe, of UK in Europe and Europe of Europe. And uh, what they've built in a short time is quite incredible. So uh, I'm thrilled to be back under UK and a changing Europe, in a changing Europe's auspices. Sorry, I keep getting the preposition wrong. <laughs> um, and congratulate them on their latest big grant from ESRC, I believe. Um, so. The, as Jonathan mentioned, the conference today is the big uh, independent assessment with some very distinguished academics and researchers coming up. I'm here to give a slightly different perspective, as Lizzie mentioned. Um, so my last big intervention, as it was in Europe, on Brexit, was a few years ago. I gave a lecture at uh, King's College London, um, uh, which got reasonable amount of notice, and a year before that, I did a video screed, or, or did a talk which turned into a video screed that went somewhat viral. And the two main points um, that I was making at the time about Brexit, from which other things followed, were first, as many others have made since, gravity matters. It's one of the few things that economics can treat as not quite a physical law, but the idea that there's real reason why you trade and invest primarily with uh, the economies that are closest to you geographically and historically, and that Brexit was just running in the face of that. And second, that Brexit wasn't just about trade, that it had to be seen in the context, not just a political economy context, but an economic context of broader actions involving foreign direct investment, financial flows, networks, um, immigration. And uh, as Lizzie said, um, unfortunately, most of the things that I and then others, including write, those writing for UK and a changing Europe, have come out pretty much as the economists would have expected. So what I'm here to do today um, is to go back a little bit, but more to go across, which is to say I want to try to put Brexit in more of a global context. And again, I want to do this in two ways. I mean, first, I want to talk a little bit about how British openness, economic openness, compares to other countries before and after Brexit. And second, I want to talk a bit about some of the other work I've been doing, which I think is highly relevant, about the changing nature or what I would call the corrosion of globalization that is taking place and that recent events, notably the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, has accelerated. And because I think a lot of the Brexit discussion 
has quite understandably tended to be focused on the domestic politics, the impact a little bit on the b b blowback to Europe, but not quite taking into account enough the global context. And then having said these two things about how Bre UK post-Brexit compares and openness and how the context is changing, I want to offer some forward-going thoughts um, about what it would mean to be a global Britain in a non-Tory slogan-hearing way, um, in a genuine way, in the current context. So with gratitude to Jonathan and the organizers for letting me be a bit um, more normative, less analytical in some ways, I guess, than some of the other papers, so I'll ask your indulgence. So there are a number of works, and again, there's some very powerful work you're going to hear later today on trade. But the basic idea of defying gravity was always a stupid one. Um, there is no Wright Brothers jet plane equivalent that gets you out of reality. Or to put it differently, um, for those of you who have seen the, the musical Wicked, there's a triumphant song by the lead character near the end in which she sings, I'm defying gravity. And she rises up over the, the mindless throng. And of course, we all know that however nobly motivated she may have been, a couple decades later, she's under a house, and or rather, her sister's under a house, and then she gets dissolved by water. Um, so the historical record of defying gravity is it looks really nice initially, and then it doesn't end well. Um, putting it differently, in economic terms, once you're defying gravity, you end up lost in space. Um, the UK has seen just overall, a huge decline in its trade because it had a huge terms of trade shock to its trade with its primary trading partner. And so then the more interesting question is, what does that mean now that it turned out exactly as we forecast? Um, so I think the first thing to be said is that um, the impact was, of course, first felt in traded goods and almost as immediately in the migrant UK, EU, work, EU labor that couldn't come in the way it once did or benefit others the once did. But it also was felt and has increasingly been felt across other dimensions, including foreign direct investment in, in UK, including the access to the scientific community and joint funding with Europe and so on. Again, the people watching this or in this audience don't need to hear all of that. But, um, what I'd like to do is just sort of give you a bit of a sense of the scale from a top-down level. And the data, which I'm going to show you, it's been put together with my colleague Lucas Regnifo Keller and Oliver Ward. It's government publicly available data, but it's, I don't think it's been put together in quite this way. So uh, can I use this? Yeah. No? Yeah. That's yeah. fine. So um, if you look at the left chart, what we're doing is just taking what is the standard uh, imports plus exports as a share of GDP. It's a rough measure. There's some critiques of it. But it's a good sense of general openness. And this compares from the start of 2017 to the latest available data we could get, which is the full end of 2021. And so the idea of making that comparison is not just since Brexit, but so that we all ignore and jump over the hump uh, or the downward hump, the valley in trade that COVID caused. And what you can see is we, in all my comparisons, we're grouping things in two sets, UK versus the large economies of Europe and UK versus what, for want of a better term, I'm calling the liberal Pacific, uh, Canada, US, Australia plus Japan. Commonwealth doesn't quite fit when you include Australia or US, but anyway. So essentially, trying to compare two different definitions of like, uh, one being who were your peers in the EU, and the other being who were your peers as global liberal democracies who are of similar values. And what you can see is just the overall decline in trade in UK is much sharper than anyone else. Canada basically suffers a trade decline because they were exporting energy and there was a period there of low energy use. And then that's since come back up. Um, you can see that on net, again, this is smoothing out COVID, 
uh, trade has continued to grow for the main economies of Europe. It's continued to grow for Australia and particularly Japan. And that for even the US, and remember this includes the Trump term, and this includes President Biden doing nothing to reverse Trump on trade, uh, trade shrunk less than it did in the UK. And so then if you look at the time series on the right, the story gets a little bit more complicated, but the basic message is, um, except for Canada, everybody else sees a recovery in trade following COVID, and the UK basically sits flat. Now, we can go into in a couple minutes whether how bad that is or how good that is. Uh, there's no simple mapping between openness and per capita GDP growth, so I don't want to oversell this. But it is a statement that at least top down post-Brexit Britain does look different than its peers in two senses. It recovered trade less from COVID than others, which is, which is I think, a nice sort of difference in difference approach. Um, if we think about receptiveness to foreigners, and Jonathan Portis is, of course, one of the world's leading experts on this, and you'll hear more from him and colleagues later, what we see is there was this long period starting, of course, uh, in the early 2000s where the UK was attracting and retaining a large number of foreign-born people. This is the, the growth in the foreign-born population, so, that, so that's sort of a proxy for immigration. And what you see is after Brexit, the EU uh, immigration just tails off and goes negative. And again, this shouldn't be a surprise, but I think people aren't quite so aware at times of how stark this is. As Jonathan has pointed out in recent writings, and I think importantly, we've not seen a sharp decline in non-EU immigration. And to the degree there is a trough of near zero EU immigration in the UK, that was largely due to Theresa May's policies at the Home Department and excuse me, the Home, Home Ministry and at the uh, as a PM. And so it is a bit of a pleasant surprise to me that when so much of the Brexit camp, pro-Brexit campaign was run on xenophobia that we have not seen the overt xenophobia in, in terms of migration from elsewhere. So one cheer. Um, but that said, remember, this shows, again, we haven't had a sudden pivot, right? We haven't seen a huge compensatory ex expansion in non-EU migration. Again, colleagues speaking later today can say more about this, but just for the broad picture, you should understand where this is. The, the, it matters for migration and therefore labor force and therefore for fiscal sustainability and therefore diversity. And the UK is different. And again, putting this in international perspective, you know, the UK differs less on this chart, but it is more the UK um, ceases to be more open than others. So if we look on the left, look at comparable Europe, Spain and Italy, of course, had this huge surge in migrants from the Med, from the Mediterranean, early in the 2000s, and then capped that off very quickly and, and went back down. But on average, if you left out, if you were to leave out that period, the UK is not hugely, but meaningfully accepting more migrants than the rest of wealthy Europe over this period. And uh, we get, this is growth, by the way, this is not levels. Um, we get to recent years, we get to post-Brexit, unfortunately we could only find data through 2020. The UK is on a downtrend. Uh, everybody else in rich Europe is back on an uptrend. And this is pre Ukraine invasion. Okay. If we look at the uh, what I'm calling the liberal Pacific, it's a little more mixed, um, but the UK had been in sort of pole position. And what I think is worth noting is contrary to a lot of people's expectations, there was significant periods, including of late, in which Japan was challenging the UK for the highest population growth among the liberal Pacific economies and in which the US has steadily been going down. Um, some of you may have seen the article I had in Foreign Affairs a couple of years ago called The Price of Nostalgia, and there's an associated set of charts on the Pearson Institute website 
just documenting how strong and how long the U.S. withdrawal from globalization has been. And so the, the self-image and the public image of the U.S. as this magnet for migration has basically been in reverse since the mid-90s. So if you want to compare the U.K. to that, the U.K. remains much more open. But I don't think that that's necessarily the standard that you want to be doing, especially when even Japan and Australia, which have their own very fraught racist histories, um, have opened up significantly in recent years. Um, okay. And so here's some data on foreign direct investment inflows. And before I go into it, there's a bunch of issues with the data I'll discuss in a second. But this, to me, is actually extremely important. Um, there's been a lot of attention, rightly, in the UK about uh, capital flows. So about the city of London uh, managing other people's money, about oligarchs from Russia and elsewhere and Middle East, maybe not laundering money, but putting money safely into London real estate and other products. And of course, there's a long history of worrying about the pound. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those issues. But what I think often gets overlooked um, is the issue of how much foreign direct investment the UK used to attract. Um, and foreign direct investment here means both brownfield and greenfield. Brownfield being you are acquiring somebody, owner from abroad is acquiring a company or a property in the UK that already exists. Greenfield that you're creating a new property. Mm -hmm. um, what's important is there's a lot of evidence, including some by colleagues of mine at the Peterson Institute, that suggests inward foreign direct investment is very positive for growth. It, there's that you tend to get higher wage jobs, you tend to get more advancement in innovation and technology, you tend to get more transfer of skills, um, and you tend to get s sales of associated business services and other things, the more FDI you get in. Now, this is controversial in some parts of left-wing Britain, um, you know, global multinationals doing bad things and so on. Um, again, we can get into it, but the data is actually pretty clear. Um, if, if, you're, if you're lacking inward FDI, you're missing a lot. And um, for those of you who long ago watched my greatest one-hit wonder, my Brexit video, you know, I, I, I talked a lot using the image of the auto industry, or not the image, the example, which has come to pass, which is not that Toyota and Nissan and Ford would stop producing cars in the UK, but they would stop producing cars in the UK for export to Europe and therefore the plants and the associated investment would decline over time and it would not be replaced. And that is what we are seeing. So now let me put it back into global perspective. By its nature, FDI flow data is extremely choppy because one very large telecom deal or financial market deal can bias the data for a given year. So what we've done is tried to do multi-year averages. And over a long period in the 90s and early 2000s, which not coincidentally, I would argue, coincides with the period following the Maastricht Treaty, following the UK having a prime role or in, in being a, um, a bridge into European markets for American and Chinese and Japanese companies, um, it all falls back in recent years. And, and this data, is, again, I want to admit, it's fully choppy, and there's one particular big transaction in financial services in 2016 that drives up that little spike, not so little spike, you see in the second to last data point. But basically, even notwithstanding that, um, the UK is no longer defying gravity or, or being an outlier uh, compared to other economies, like economies in terms of forward and direct investment inward foreign direct investment, excuse me. Um, and so again, there is this step change, which I think more recent data will continue to bear out. So the international comparison is in all these dimensions, immigration, foreign direct investment, volume of trade. We've been trying to get some data um, on uh, what tariffs the UK faces and other measures of, of not so much how open the UK is, but what access the UK is to the rest of the world. 
and I'm hoping to put out in under UK and into changing Europe auspices uh, follow up on this lecture with more details. But just to say that it's not just the UK has in a sense had the Brexit experience, it's the Brexit experience <laughs> has taken the UK either back from being a leader in international openness and attractiveness to the average or from the average to below average in international openness and leadership. Um, so what I did was, it shows you how much the world changes. So several years ago when I was last making charts myself, um, spider charts, which is what these are called, were the hot thing. I then spoke to my young colleague Lucas and said, can you help me make some charts and data? And he's like, sure, what's a spider chart? Because of course now things have gotten completely uh, advanced beyond that. But so humor old fogey me. What a spider chart does is it says, takes a number of dimensions. We we're hoping to have a fourth dimension, but for now we have a three dimension. Um, and it says you can, you can sort of standardize by the size of the measures in your sample and says how far are, out are you. And so if you look at the left two pieces, um, in comparison to the rest, the other major economies in Europe and then in the liberal Pacific on the bottom, the red triangle shows you just how uh, much more open the UK was even just a, a decade ago, or five, seven years ago. And you look at the bottom uh, chart, the UK was essentially the most open by far. If you think of the area of the red triangle versus the others, the UK was the most open by far of the in economic terms of uh, Canada, Australia, US, and Japan. And in comparison to Europe, the UK was the most open by far in terms of FDI and immigration, and was roughly average in trade. And so we fast forward a few years, and again, I've offered to Lizzie, or she kindly asked, and all, all our data will be posted on the Institute website. You can check our calculations. You can do more interesting things with it than I've thought of doing. Um, well, once we, once, you know, it may not be today, it may be next week, but it will be there and you can play with the data and I hope advance it. If we shift to the right column, we're looking post-Brexit, and you can see how the red triangle has completely shrunk. So this is post-Brexit, post-COVID. And so now the UK is essentially the lowest or the second lowest on inward FDI, on immigration, and on trade compared to Europe. And it went to being still noticeably more open on trade than the liberal Pacific economies, but not more so on immigration or inward FDI. So again, just that's the picture. Okay. So um, putting it in more time series, so this is just summarizing the previous charts. And I'm sorry to belabor it, this is the chart I, that I have my little comment on. Um, so the, the dark red is the current state of the UK. The pink hot pink is the previous state of the UK, the cool Britannia area, era, um, or pre-Brexit, let's be more accurate rather than cute. Um, and then the lines in the background are based on the average of the countries in the sample. And so whether you look at it, all the rich countries looked at, at EU or even at non-EU, you can just see the shrinkage of the British world economically. So let me now subject you to some minutes of things that are not charts, um, trying to get beyond the point I have so laboriously driven home. So I, I think it has to be said that um, for all my worries about Brexit and things turning out pretty much as we said, there have been two positive surprises. The first, as I said, is my deep concern had been uh, I think not unreasonably, but I'm glad to have been wrong, that Brexit represented a truly nationalist, xenophobic shift in policy, and at least on immigration, we haven't seen that. It's been very anti-EU immigration, but it has not been made things any worse um, on the general immigration. And the second one where I want to be acknowledge I was, one of my fears what turned out so far not to be justified, and which I think is very important, is I was quite worried that, given what happened was what I expected, 
that the UK would try to engage in a race to the bottom, particularly on financial services and standards, in order to try to attract capital and, and, and investment it, to make up for what it was losing. And I have to say, again, for whatever differences I have with the Johnson government and others, to their credit, um, there has not been a big deregulatory wave in the city and financial sector. Um, I had the privilege to host another old friend of mine, uh, Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England at the Peterson Institute uh, a week ago yesterday, I think, or a week ago today. No, a week ago tomorrow, sorry, um, last Thursday. I had the privilege to host uh, UK Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, and he strongly reaffirmed on the record that there's not going to be any race to the bottom on financial services. And I, so far, he's been right, and I hope he maintains that. Um, so I mean, there are some positive things. What remains to play for, in a sense, um, is what economists refer to as the dynamic effects of trade and investment. And the dynamic effects are essentially what affects the trend growth rate going forward, not just the volume of what you're doing, what inputs you have, it's how well you're using them. And the basic concern when one shrinks the triangle of trade and openness, as it were, um, which go, is that you are losing competition internally. And therefore, you get less innovation and less turnover and dynamism in your corporate sector, in your investments, and in your labor force. And that, as mentioned, I mentioned with FDI and Jonathan and others can speak out with respect to immigration, it also tends to de decrease your dynamism when you lose diversity of talent coming in and diversity of corporate cultures and so on. Um, again, just to be very clear, in the literature, the empirical literature we have, the direct effect of trade on productivity growth is not is there, but not terribly clear. The direct effect of immigration and FDI on productivity growth is quite clear and quite strong. And to the degree that you end up with less competition in an economy, whether through trade or other means, that definitely negatively affects productivity growth over the long run. So that's what's to play for. And, um, Various people, including the current prime minister, have at times invoked so-called global Britain as an ideal. And initially, when this term was being tossed about, I was very dismissive. I, I said, they're not going to be Singapore on the Thames. I just don't want them to become Cayman Islands on the Thames. Um, and as I said, at least with respect to financial regulation, I'm thankful that so far that's not clearly not what's happening. And it may be that one salutary, unintended side effect of the, the war crimes, the, the tragic invasion of Ukraine by Russia, is that London and the UK are self-evaluating the extent to which they were a money-changing place for people with ill-gotten gains. Um, let's leave that aside now and look forward. What would be mean to be a global Britain in the current context? And the first thing to be said is that you're going back to gravity. You're not going to expand that triangle of openness and certainly not the apex of trade um, by making deals with a bunch of non-European economies. Or you'll expand it over time, but not in a big way. Um, it's changed a little bit since I quoted David Cameron in 2017, but you know you still have more trade with Ireland than you do with essentially all what used to be called the BRICS, except China. And even China has only recently passed Ireland as a share of UK trade. So to whatever degree one thinks that trade is an issue going forward, yeah, it's nice to try to do a deal with Australia and New Zealand where you give them side payments to get back to where you were <laughs> when you were a member of the EU. It's better than the alternative. It's OK to fantasize about a trade deal with India. Um, the, 
the destroyed careers of trade negotiators of all countries who've traded, tried to make deals with India um, through, the, through the last few decades, I think should be a cave hic dragones warning for all, but fine. Um, you can certainly, as the UK, and for a bunch of strategic and economic reasons, I would encourage applying to join the Comprehensive Partnership for Trade, yeah, the CPTPP. I can, I can never keep the acronym straight since they replaced TPP. CPTPP. I think that would be great. But this is all small beer, small potatoes, small whatever you want to call it. Um, so, what should be the global Britain strategy going forward? Well, unfortunately, and this is something where I will not backtrack on things that I've said in the past, unfortunately, the attitude of a lot of British policymakers and politicians, in particular of the current government and those who supported Brexit, who are among the current government, is that the UK can basically decide what it wants and others will have to deal with it, um, as opposed to the UK is now a relatively small economy in a big world and has to adapt. And I don't think that mindset is yet gone. Um, I wish it was. What I want to do now, though, is talk a little bit about why that's a little more challenging now than it would have been even a few years ago. As uh, former Prime Minister Harold Macmillan once said, you know, events, dear boy, events are what determine policy. Uh, COVID and the Russian invasion of Ukraine are real events. The anti-globalization politics in the US that, as I mentioned, I have documented has been building for more than 20 years is a real trend and event. Um, the rise of China and with that, which was not inevitable, but by Chinese choice, with that, the increasingly um, not just autocratic at home, but aggressive actions in global economic affairs by China is a real event. And so when the UK government and the UK public opinion and people like you all who are part of forming that public opinion uh, think about what the UK can and should do, it is not just, oh, we hold all the cards in the negotiation or, oh, we will just make the best deals we can. There is a real environment you have to think about. And so what is this environment? Um, so I published about a month and a half ago a piece in Foreign Affairs Online, which, of course, I don't get to choose the title. As you all know who write for anything, uh, editors get to choose the title. So the title was The End of Globalization? Question mark. And they were right because that happened to be a nice hook. But my, my view is not that globalization is ending, but as I mentioned, the globalization is corroding. And why do I fixate on that particular word as opposed to deglobalization, globalization, end of globalization, pick your verb, or noun? Um, noun, actually. Um, I emphasize corrosion because consistent with what I tried to present a few minutes ago, globalization is really a multi-layered fabric. It's not just about trade. It's about investment. It's about business networks. It's about transfers of ideas. It's about humans moving back and forth. It's about intellectual capital. And even within trade, it's very differentiated what the nature of it, depending on what's being traded. Is it business services? Is it commodities? And so what we're seeing is, and have been seeing for a while now, is that globalization has been corroding, meaning it's fraying in parts. It's not that it's stopped expanding. We can look at CPTPP, for example. There are trade deals, major trade deals among significant economies going on. But in some places, one layer gets eaten away. In some places, there's holes. In another place, it's, it's, it's frayed. I already used that image, sorry. You, you put it all together, and the fabric is much looser, much more subject to tear, and is much more uneven than it once was. And for those of you who are into the political science international relations vision of this, that's exactly what you would expect if the rules-based system 
the, the U.S. Uh, encouragement and enforcement of a rules-based order for organizing economic activity has been eroding. And that is, of course, exactly what's happening. So things get more political, they get more spotty, they're more uneven. And that is, of course, a world that's much worse for development, economic development of low and middle income economies. Again, I'm not suggesting that the US was this munificent charitable institution that selflessly brought the developing world into richness. Of course not. But the US was, for several decades, into the early 90s from the war, basically providing a situation where the default was companies and countries who could get into globalization could do so on a somewhat fair basis. And if they had complaints, they could get them addressed in a somewhat fair way. And the default was the world was less about direct military power and bribery and more about markets. And that may sound like a very qualified claim, but it is not an accident that coincided with the greatest rise, most widespread rise in human living standards in world history. And that is not just China. That's hundreds of millions of people in India and Eastern Europe and other parts of South Asia and a little bit in Africa and some in Latin America. But that's going away. And in a world where we have China and the US getting more political and getting more domineering and the institutions are less reliable, you end up with a lot of developing countries, and this will be even more evident in the years to come, having to choose sides. And that limits their economic options, or having to make political capitulations in order to get what they want. And if you're feeling very clever like Argentina, you can try to play off China is going to bail us out. The U.S. says, I don't want you to take money from China, take money from the IMF. Argentina says, well, you want me to take money from the IMF? It better be softer conditions than last time. And somehow it is. Um, occasionally that's going to work, but generally that's not going to be a great strategy. It's not good for the world. And so my view, as I set out in this end of globalization question mark article, is that these long-term trends of China and the US were already corroding globalization, but frankly, the EU and Japan and Australia and some others in Singapore were, were a big bulwark against this, and at least on the U US side could sort of push the US not to be too awful about it. But then comes COVID, and there is a very reasonable reevaluation of global supply chains for issues of shortages and resilience. And then comes Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and politicians take it too far, but quite reasonably suggest, uh, maybe I don't want to have all my sourcing from one place, and certainly not sourcing from places that are geopolitically or ethically or national security suspect. And so what's the result of all this? So the result is, and this is me forecasting what's underway and what will become more visible over the next couple of years is that um, it's easier to put in sort of good space and talk about industry, but it's about much more than just trade and manufactured goods. But so essentially you have a large number of multinational companies and investors increasingly encouraged on a national security basis by their governments to say, okay, I have to reallocate where my investments are, I have to essentially buy costly insurance and build redundant production trains, uh, processes, or sourcing of products or sourcing of inputs. And I may essentially have to create one ecosystem to build and sell into the greater China and one ecosystem to, to source and build and trade into North America. and. The one in going into Europe is going to be uh, partially open to the U.S., but I should expect that it's going to be less open to the U.S. and vice versa uh, in coming years. And so in that world, as my friend, the WTO director Ngozi, has spoken about trying to put a positive on it, or as 
some of the cabinet members of the Biden team have called it friendshoring, or um, ECB President Christine Lagarde gave a speech at the Peterson Institute on Friday talking about open strategic autonomy, which I think is a preview for what Macron is going to push in Europe. It's about making very strong political choices to encourage friendshoring, nearshoring, a lot of tests and national security direction about where things get produced, where things get imported, and so on. Now again, it's kind of analogous to Brexit in the sense that, as I said repeatedly and others, and I think UK ICE has talked about, you can set out the economic pros and cons of a situation that is entirely reasonable, and I would argue in some cases fully justified, for elected officials or the population to say, I don't care about the economic consequences or my values, my sovereignty, my human rights are more important than the economic consequences. That's, you know, that's the way democracy should work. But um, it is similar to Brexit also that this is a world where trading opportunities are going to be more constrained, where investments will be losing some e economies of scale, um, where you're taking out more self-insurance, which may be the rational thing to do, which again lowers your returns on capital, and where self-interested special interests and companies will be increasingly able to exploit saying, hey, I'm your national champion or I'm your regional champion, you gotta protect me. So that's the world now, and I think increasingly so over the next few years at least, and I'm sad, I'm just checking the timer on my clock. Um, I'm sad that's the case, and I'm devoting my professional life to trying to change that. But if that's the world we're in for the next few years, what does this mean for a post-Brexit Ukraine that I was describing earlier? What would it mean to be a global Britain in a deglobalizing world? So let me conclude by talking about a few things on that thought. Um, the previous talks about global Britain, and I did find, or Lucas helped me find, a, uh, a sort of white paper from the government that talks about what a global Britain would be. And again, it, most of the stuff under this heading up till now has been misleading or misguided. Um, and essentially, it's about accumulating trade deals and then a lot of fluff. Um, now, what the UK has done is defy gravity at a time when the world is shrinking in economic terms. And to extend this analogy to painful links, and I'm sure Lizzie can smack me about for this, but um, as the world shrinks, its gravitational pull on you shrinks. So in other words, the chances that if you're off in space, you're just gonna float away go up. The UK is increasingly unanchored to anything in economic terms. And the things to which it is anchored, like the WTO um, or the US-UK alliance, are getting politicized and becoming more undependable less powerful, and so they're less good anchor. And so it's no longer just, oh, we're out of the EU, the EU can make deals on regulations without us at the table. It's now, is the world gonna make deals without us at the table, or worse, is the world gonna divide up without even bothering to make deals, and we get forgotten about. Now, I, I'm not, this is directional. It's not like the UK is gonna disappear as an economy. It, it's the, the very sound numbers that UK ICE and others have come up about the costs of Brexit strike me as a little bit low, but very reasonable. You know, a few percentage points of GDP over a few years, um, and then, as I said, to play for how much of a permanent effect or a lasting effect on growth. But what I would suggest is it's no longer about 
being excluded from the EU or self-excluding from the EU, it's that you're not part of any big block when the world is dividing at the blocks to, vast, to massively oversimplify. And in terms of friend shoring or open strategic autonomy, well, you're certainly not part of EU's strategic autonomy plans. And for the US, particularly for manufacturing, it's not clear what good you do versus a Mexico or, a, or a, another developing economy that has cheaper wages and potentially more uh, growth potential for the US planning process. So I think the way forward for a global Britain in this world has um, four elements. First, and this is something that probably is going to be very old news for this audience, but you have to, you being UK decision makers, you being informed UK public opinion, you have to, even more than before, resist the imperial hangover delusions. Um, this is a problem for the US, it's a problem for France, it's a problem for everybody, but it's still a problem for you. Right? So, I mean, again, I'm not saying anyone in this audience would say it, but it's like talking about mental health. You'd think, I'm crazy. Well, you're crazy. Well, fine. You're both crazy, but you still need help. Um, the, the idea that there's going to be renewed Commonwealth, special relationship with U.S., special relationship with India um, is just fanciful. Um, but the worst thing, I think, is letting the UK's security ambitions and foreign policy grandeur, which still has more justification than its economic, uh, drive economic decisions. Uh, these, the national security and economics are going to be joined together in coming years, unfortunately, but probably not in ways that are favorable to the UK. And so you have to let some of this go. And I get, I get sick. Liter li not literally. I'm sounding too much like a 20-year-old. Um, I get nauseated, literally. Um, whenever I hear, you know, President Biden in the U.S. or other cabinet officials in the Biden administration, who I assure you I'm much happier with than the previous administration, you know, talk about U.S. is back. U.S. is a leader. Well, on sanctions, yeah. Um, on economics, no. Um, and so it's even more ridiculous, and I had this in a discussion with then Trade Secretary uh, Liz Truss, uh, we did a couple of years ago, the idea that the UK will somehow lead the new regime in economics. Now that we're no longer in Europe, we can lead ahead. I mean, nobody wants you to lead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, follow. Follow constructively. Try to make sure you get to join the right clubs from here on out. Be a good member. Second thing I think for making a global Britain work economically is um, to not think so much about trade, but think fundamentally about attracting good labor and capital. And here, as I tried to indicate in my opening and at various times during the charts, I'm actually more hopeful than I would have guessed I would be at this point. Um, as I said, we haven't seen the total anti-immigration turn that I feared Brexit portended. Uh, we haven't seen the financial race to the bottom that I feared Brexit portended. Um, we have even seen, although again partly due to tragic other events, uh, at least some sense of turning away from uh, capital that's just different forms of sort of money laundering. Um, these are positive. This is something you can build on. You should be, and this is where you can be a leader, as the people here from King's College London know well and other universities, attracting the students of the world is a very high value proposition. And if the US continues to behave as it's behaving, your market share should only grow. And it will mean more for you than for the US because your market is smaller. 
um, attracting FDI rather than uh, short-term flows of capital or, or throughput of capital may not be feasible in the auto sector, for example, but it is feasible in R&D and business services and specialized services. So thinking in terms of attracting labor and capital rather than trade, I think, is the second point. The third point, to do my final defying gravity bit, let gravity pull you back to Earth before you end up floating away. Um, as an American, as an American who's served and worked and lived in the UK and loves the UK, but as an American, I can say what others cannot. You really should go back to a EFTA-like soft Brexit deal. You should be working towards that. There's no substitute for it. And the kind of world I described is going to make that even more the case than it used to be. And so, I mean, you can get into the niceties of what that actually means, but essentially, regulatory convergence on the European model and accepting that in trade issues you're going to become like Switzerland or Sweden is really what, or what you should be doing. Switzerland or Norway, excuse me. Um, go ahead with CPTPP. Go ahead with these other bilateral deals. But what's really going to bring you back to Earth is, is by hook or by crook, quietly or openly, um, reversing some aspects of Brexit. And finally, fourthly, the one place where the UK did, I think, often, not always, but often live up to its self-image and its ideals was being in policy spheres a uh, mediator of sorts between the UK and the EU. Not a mediator in the literal sense of mediating disputes, although that did happen occasionally. But I, I probably need a better word than mediator, but essentially a, a middle force intellectually between U American and European policy proclivities in the economic arena. And that goes back to the charts that I showed, that while the UK, in terms of closedness, the shrinking red triangle, has moved much more closed compared to what it was before and compared to the big economies of Europe, it remains at least as open and in some ways still much more open than the US and the liberal Pacific nations. And so there is room, in particular, in the setting of standards over technology transfer, foreign direct investment, human rights and investment, financial services, where the UK can play a constructive role that would be in its own self-interest and in the world's self-interest. We can get there. There is a path to a global Britain in a changing world economy. I hope you all will help me convince the political leadership in Britain to take it. Thank you very much. Um, somewhat depressing, but appreciate I on a positive note. <laughs> appreciate you not pulling your punches. Um, I want to start with the inflation question. It's obviously something you would have thought about a lot at the Bank of England. Consumer price growth running at a 30-year high in the UK. Of course, this is a problem around the world, but the yeah. Bank of England's leading the path on monetary tightening. Uh, we're expecting the fourth back-to-back -back rate rise next week. And of course, the war in Ukraine has exacerbated the inflation problem, but the seeds were already planted in the pandemic, but of course, before that with Brexit. The IMF, looking ahead, says that inflation in the UK will remain elevated for longer than any of its G7 peers. So Adam, is the reason that the UK's inflation problem is going to be worse, Brexit's impact on immigration and the labor market by making the labor market even tighter? 80% yes. Um, so I think that's absolutely right, Lizzie, to think about it this way. So what all the major economies, major so large economies, large market economies are facing is this combination of um, disruption and labor inelasticity, to put it in economy speak, um, economists speak, 
as a result of COVID and the reopening. And we see, as my colleague Jason Furman has taken great pains to spell out in the data, but I think it's pretty obvious, we see a very large gap between the inflation rate in the US and the inflation rate in Europe. And there's been some convergence, but it's clearly almost entirely due to the energy shock, which of course affects Europe much more than affects the US for a variety of reasons. So if you take out energy, which you should, there's you know two to three percentage points a year of at an annualized rate rather of inflation higher in the US than in Europe which when you were starting off with inflation targets at 2%, that's a big number. Um, I know you asked about the UK, I will, I will get there. Um, so where is the UK in this? So the UK ends up, as Governor Bailey said in his remarks at Peterson last week, and I think this is accurate, the UK ends up sort of in between. It doesn't have, for now, quite the inflation rate the US does, and, but it does have a labor market that looks more like the US. And so, and so arguably, the um, inflation factors in the UK are more like the US, meaning less transitory, less defined by the supply shock, more likely to have inertia and persist. Um, how much is Brexit, so why did I say 80%? How much is Brexit to blame? You know, I, I think, that, and Jonathan's written some stuff I've read in the popular press where he, he argues don't overdo this, and certainly the Bank of England argues that, or at least says it's too hard to tell what's Brexit and what's not Brexit, as you've reported on. Um, I, I, I think we're all getting a little too cute. Um, you know, you've seen a huge drop in migrant labor. You've seen a disruption in labor markets that everybody experienced due to COVID and reopening, but with fundamentally less room and elasticity uh, for reply because of Brexit. And that has to be part of it. Um, that has to be a major part of it. Because when you look at the monetary factors or the growth factors, you know, sort of process of elimination, all the other things we talk about it, it, the UK doesn't look that different than the Euro area. Um, so then there's also a question of how much is Brexit affecting the macroeconomic side directly in the sense of inflation expectations and financial flows, which again, I know you've kept track of. Um, and there's a place, again, where I've been surprised, actually despite the recent news, I've been surprised positively. As Jonathan knows and is too kind to point out, um, Going back to 2017, I kept expecting the pound to lose a lot, particularly versus the euro, as a result of Brexit. And that has not happened. And so beyond the usual warning ones, you never try to predict exchange rates. Um, you know, I, th I think it has to be said that the credibility of the monetary regime, the inflation targeting regime of the Bank of England, has held up better despite Brexit than I expected. So, but again, it, it's, when you look at the macro factors, um, it's very difficult to see anything other than the labor market issues. And when you look at the labor market issues and there's been no regulatory changes and no sudden shocks to the, to the nature of the labor market, it really seems like Brexit has to bear a disproportionate role in explaining the inflation. Okay, well, uh, they're looking for answers to the cost of living. They're looking to tariff cuts on food, uh, reported today. Of course, one of the big drivers of UK inflation is food. Just this morning, a report by the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics showed that um, Brexit has driven food prices up 6%. And we know that that's partly because of border delays and the impact on uh, goods that are perishable, but also because of extra red tape. But the physical checks on EU inputs of goods have been delayed, delayed, delayed. There's speculation that they'll be delayed again in July. So while food producers complain that that would give EU exporters an unfair advantage, uh, to uh, do the delays to the checks show that Tolerating smuggling is the only way we can practically make Brexit happen. <laughs> I, 
All right, that one I'm not going to say yes or no, um, <laughs> even with a percentage. Um, but I, I do think you're on to something very fundamental, Lizzie. I mean, again, food, for obvious reasons, and I'm obviously someone who values food above pretty much all else, um, <laughs> food, for obvious reasons, takes an outsized importance in our consciousness. And I'm reminded of the um, Calvin and Hobbes strip, which uh, they wrote when it was the We Are the World for Famine in Ethiopia. And, and Calvin says, it's amazing. It's terrible to think that there are all the people who go hungry and have I can't believe it. And Hobbes the tiger says, wow, I know what that feels like. And, uh, and, and Calvin says, no, you don't. Um, so I know you didn't mean it this way, Lizzie. This is me being sort of sanctimonious. I'm sorry. But I mean, we, we, let's, all of us in the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> again, I know you weren't saying this, but let's all of us in the Northern Hemisphere use this moment to realize that food inflation of 6% is nothing to compare to the people right now in Egypt and the Middle East who are literally going to do without cooking oil and wheat. OK, anyway, close percent. Close parentheses. Um, shorter, shorter reply. Food is something that is not easily substitutable because it's seasonal. The better food for you is, the less substitutable it is. So there's no way to exaggerate the effect of not having people to pick the strawberries and pick the, pick the seasonal vegetables and fruit in the UK didn't matter. But of course, that's now or now past that. I think the ultimate message is, yeah, you're running a natural experiment on what happens when you suddenly run a trade war on yourself. This is what happens. Um, now, at the Peterson Institute, we just published, and I think we've gotten some traction with the Biden administration. We did a serious careful attempt by two different methods to say, OK, if you cut tariffs in the US, what would it do to inflation? And we just published this, and it's gotten picked up. And I think we're contributing and some new noise coming out of the Biden administration. I mean, again, it doesn't change the fundamental macroeconomics of inflation, but it is material. So our estimates were if you cut basically the tariffs that Trump put on, so not specifically them, but sort of the same amount of tariffs across the US economy, just that, you could reduce the inflation rate by 1.5%, plus or minus, probably a little less, but between 1.3 plus or minus. And that's a big number. And so, sorry, bottom line, I'm glad to hear about the announcement today that they're looking at that. The, you run a trade war against yourself, bad things happen. Better to retreat. OK, well, a quick reminder, if you're in the audience in the room or if you're watching at home, please do send in your questions via Slido and we'll, or maybe Slido, I don't know. <laughs> Slido. Um, and we'll come to them in just a little while. Um, Adam, you argue that trade gravity is a stronger force than any idea of a special relationship we may have with the US. Um, from your perspective in Washington, how far off is a post-Brexit UK-US trade deal? Is it even possible, given the lingering tensions over Northern Ireland? Close to impossible. Um, so here, I'll just be brief. Um, the UK, the US Congress, for its own reasons, all of which pretty much are bad, um, doesn't want to approve any trade deals of any kind with anybody, except trade deals that uh, make things slightly better on environment and labor standards, which I'm in favor of, and make things worse in terms of protecting US industries, which I'm not in favor of. So like USMCA, which was the uh, supposed update for NAFTA um, with Mexico and Canada, uh, improved somewhat uh, environmental and labor standards agreements with Mexico, with Canada, they were already high, and went way backwards in terms of allowing Mexicans companies and subsidiaries to export to the US. So, and that just shows you what the state of affairs are. 
So even before we get to Northern Ireland, um, you know, what's in the trade deal for the U.S. that would cause Congress to do anything? Basically nothing. Um, so, you know, I think we just had, I guess, the meeting between U.S. Ambassador Tai and, I'm sorry, I lost the name of your current trade minister. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. My apologies to Minister Trevelyan. Um, we just had the, that's me getting old, that's not a slight, that's not meant as a slight. Um, we had the meeting between Trevelyan and Tai, and there was basically an empty statement that came out of it, which is fine because there wasn't going to be anything else. So then you throw on Northern Ireland. And again, for this audience, this probably doesn't need saying, but let me just say it again. The people who claim Irish descendants in the U.S. is a very large number. They are concentrated, they're spread out throughout the country, but there are concentrations of them in particular districts and states. As a result, even on a cynical basis, a large number of leaning Democratic politicians feel very vested in uh, the Good Friday Agreement and in peace and security in Ireland. And some of them, frankly, if you went back 25 years, had Sinn Féin sympathies. Um, and then you go beyond the cynicism. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and the President of the United States, Joseph Biden, have Irish ethnic backgrounds and feel this very personally. So this is not going to happen. A percent, please. hundred <laughs> uh. percent. Um, and in your talk, you mentioned Brexit's impact on foreign direct investment. And of course, it's not just inflation that the IMF warned about last week, it's also growth. Uh, they slashed their growth forecast for the UK economy so that now the IMF sees the UK having the slowest growth of all the G7 nations. And one of the reasons was investment. If you combine the Brexit effect with the loss of Russian money, can we ever get back to our former status on FDI and growth? You can get back part, probably most of the way over several years, but not immediately, and it will take work. Um, so I appreciate the question, Lizzie. And it just sort of goes back to the way I tried to conclude my talk, which is don't focus on things like the US-UK trade deal that isn't going to happen. Focus on things that would make you an attractive destination for foreign direct investment, and they have to be different than they were in the past if, as you rightly said, it's not about Russian money laundering and it's not about being a platform for uh, foreign companies to export into Europe. Mm. And so there, again, there are plenty of ways, British technical abilities, British cultural abilities, British services, essentially going back to the Blair Brown Cool Britannia. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, I mean, that's what you have to sell. There may be a bunch of other things I don't know about yet. That's the great thing about a free market economy. But I know you no longer should be selling essentially offshore accounts for oligarchs. And you no longer should be selling, we can make cars that go into, to go into France. Because neither of those go forward. So in terms of numbers, you know, I showed that chart of which, again, the data is messy. It's up and down. But you can see, if you look on that chart, um, in my talk, you can see that the UK was well above its weight, to use the expression, in terms of attracting FDI in the 90s and early 2000s, pre-Brexit. And um, that was a real outlier status that I think was thrown away in large part by Brexit, but in part because of these more fundamental changes in the corroding of the global economy that I mentioned. So can you get back to that height? Probably not. But can you get back to being more than comparable to your European neighbors and doing better um, you know, in relative to the size of your economy than Australia, Japan, US? Yes, you can do that. OK, a bit of hope. Um, we're going to take questions for, through Slido, if you've got one. Um, the most popular one so far is from Philip Lingard, and he says, Will a Labour government find the 4% GDP boost from rejoining the Single Market and Customs Union irresistible and join those avoiding full political membership debate? 
That's a good question. I don't know enough about the politics. I mean, I obviously follow it, but I don't pretend like Anand and others who don't pretend to actually know uh, the politics to make an intelligent comment. I, I would just say, all, as, all things aside, I think Labor or whoever would be serving the British public interest by saying, yep, we tried this, it didn't work, um, or it worked all too well. And therefore, whatever we want to do about political sovereignty separate from Europe, we got to try to get back mostly towards Europe economically. Now, again, that may be politically completely a non-starter, but you know, as this conference will discuss, there have been a lot of things that have happened that have not been good from an economic point of view. The next question comes from uh, VJ Srao, who says, all things equal, all things aren't equal given COVID and the war in Ukraine. So how can you assess Brexit fairly? You can assess it fairly by accepting a certain amount of humility and inaccuracy. But you can still be fair. I mean, in like literally in statistic terms, you can be unbiased, but, but less efficient in your estimates. Um, and that's why I tried to do things even in these very simple charts. And the the better complement to that is some of the papers we're going to be hearing at this conference the rest of the day, which goes into micro data, like the study about the breakdown in relationships of small businesses exporting to the EU that's going to be discussed. Um, but this is why I did, in my charts and in my talk, I did essentially what, what a very simple version of what economists call difference and difference. I'm saying, OK, every, in a sense, to put it in crude econometric terms, the identification problem is in some ways easier because everybody had the same COVID shock at the same time. Everybody had the same Russian invasion shock and disruption to markets at the same time. So the question is, what about the structures of your economy led to the shock being transmitted or amplified or diminished in your economy? And that's why, Lizzie, your question earlier about, say, inflation, you know, you, you look across the economies and you say, UK inflation falls in between EU and US. Given energy, you would have thought they would, you would have thought they would be below EU if it hadn't, and some of that may be due to idiosyncrasies of the British natural gas market, fine. But you know, you, you try to pull that out and you say, huh, there's a definite labor effect here and it's pretty evident in the UK that it's not so evident in most of Europe and looks more like the US. What's going on here? You know, so I, I think, is it definitive proof? No, but in some ways, the, the, the intellectual case gets stronger because you've had a common shock across economies and you're looking at how they responded to the shock. Some of the data I presented, we tried the other way you can try to be fair. Again, may or may not be persuasive, but I will stand by fair, is to take very comparable data and say, let's smooth out those shocks. You know, what's the, what's the change from before all that to now. And that's why I love that scene of the shrinking triangle of, of, of openness for Britain. Not that I love the outcome, but the visual of it. Because, I mean, again, on trade, not just Germany, France, Italy, Spain, they all see a bounce back in trade from the low in 2020. UK does not. Canada, especially now with energy, US, Australia, Japan, they all see something of a bounce, not as big, but something of a bounce back from trade. UK does not. Okay, and, the, and I know that study from the Centre for Economic Performance did try to strip out the effects of the pandemic. The last question I'm going to jump to on Slido is from Stephen Boxall, and he says, if the UK was the most open economy prior to Brexit and openness is good, why were so many people so dissatisfied in the UK that they voted to leave the EU? That's a very valid question. Um, and it goes back to something I've, I've and others have been saying for a long time, and I mentioned in the middle of my talk, which is economics isn't everything, right? Um, people voted for the UK, I mean, excuse me, for Brexit, for a variety of reasons. And as best as we can tell from the polling data combined with the location data, it seems to have been motivated by political ideological factors 
as much as by straight economic factors. And again, there are plenty of people in this room who've gone through this much more detail than I, but this is a global point. It, it, you look at the US, people tried to say Trump came in because people were angry about economics. But when you looked at the micro data, the, the swing to people voting for Trump was small business people and ex-urban people who were white, and particularly white women. And they were not disproportionately affected by the things that brought in Trump. Um, but they made a choice. And similarly in the UK, and again, other experts in the room may want to contest this, but I mean, I always, I always look back at Ireland, I mean, excuse me, at Wales, right? Wales, you know, if anybody was paying any attention, right, the simplest fact was Wales was getting the most money per capita from Europe, except for a couple little parts of Scotland, right? Because they got convergence funds and they got agriculture funds and they got, let's try to shut down coal funds. And, you know, it was very clear. You were going to be taking a material hit to your standard of living and to your communities if you voted for Brexit in Wales. And it is perfectly reasonable and acceptable for people in Wales to say, I don't care about that as much as I care about the color of my passport and the color of the immigrants coming in near me. That may or may not be nice, but that's their choice. They're allowed. But that don't tell me it's about economics. And, and economics was bad because they voted against the straight economics. And I mean, again, this, this conference is about the economics of Brexit. It should be. I think the evidence is pretty clear, as the papers that are about to be presented will show you. But that's just another argument of saying the reasons for Brexit, for at least most voters, had to be non-economic. Well, on that note, we've run out of time. Thank you so much to Adam Posen uh, for all your thoughts, for everyone listening and for all the questions you sent in, and to Jonathan and UK in a Changing Europe for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.